It's time to do 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 All right, I'm not going to do this this video with a stupid mask on. A lot of times when people talk about Yu-Gi-Oh games on the internet, they come at it from a perspective of a huge Yu-Gi-Oh nerd. And despite this goofy mask that I've had my entire life, that is not me. Now, I absolutely loved Yu-Gi-Oh as a kid. This mask is from when I was either seven or eight years old and I went as Yu-Gi for Halloween. But these days, I don't own a single card anymore. As I grew older, I did not keep up. When GX came out, I vaguely remember watching a little bit of that, but it never was an obsession. With this, I was obsessed. Yu-Gi-Oh was like my favorite thing in the entire world for, I don't know, two years, a year and a half, something like that. So, I'm not a huge fan. I never really played the card game, because of course when you're a kid you don't play it correctly, you just kind of make up bullshit as you go along, like they do in the show. Meaning I have no understanding of how the metagame works, how um, all these newfangled like tuner or synchro summons or whatever the fuck the new mechanics are. So I got back into Yu-Gi-Oh! a little bit when Duel Links came out. Even that eventually progressed to the point where I had no interest in keeping up with it anymore. All of this just to say that my primary source of Yu-Gi-Oh! knowledge comes from watching the show as a kid on Cartoon Network. And Cartoon Network only aired the first two seasons, so I don't even know what happens in the second half of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! show. So if you hear me using incorrect terms, or I just come off as generally ignorant as to how Yu-Gi-Oh! works, or the franchise as a whole, that's why. I'm not a huge Yu-Gi-Oh! guy. As a kid, I had some video games, and there exist a slew of them, much more than I realized. For example, on the Game Boy Advance, did you know that there existed 12 Yu-Gi-Oh! games just on that platform alone? And they were all over. As a kid, I had Forbidden Memories on the PlayStation 1. But they were on everything, and that's thanks to Konami, the video game company, the alleged video game company these days, owning not only the rights to produce Yu-Gi-Oh! video games, but they also were the people that manufactured the card game. They had a stake in this franchise as a whole, aside from just being hired to make video games for it. So they ran these fucking releases into the ground. They were putting out game after game after game, sometimes like three a year, which is insane for one franchise to get three games a year. Du du duel! Time to duel! Duel! Time because this is the most hardcore video game I have played since at least Barbie Explorer. These days, Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories is infamous for speedrunning because of how random it is. It was the first game in the franchise to be released over here in America, and the fourth made overall. It's so old that not only did the card game not even have an official rule set, but the anime hadn't even started airing yet. Now, there was a lesser known adaptation in Japan which aired in 98, but that didn't focus on the card game, and it's not in the same canon as the more famous show we saw over here. So Konami was basically flying blind while making this game. All they could really do was look at the books and then interpret how this fictional card game could be played if it happened to be real. So being faced with these obstacles, how did they do? What's the right word I'm looking for? Bad? Crappy? Mystifying? Yeah, that's probably the best one. It's certainly not something that was made with multiple players in mind, even though it does have multiplayer. Forbidden Memories' take on the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game is a glorified bout of war. You know, the 52 card standard playing card game where you and an opponent take turns randomly drawing cards out of a deck, with the winner being whoever draws the higher number. In Forbidden Memories, you're only allowed to play one card per turn. Unlike in the real game, where you're allowed to play as many magic and trap cards as you want in addition to one monster. And unlike in the show even, where they would seemingly be allowed to play their whole goddamn hand if they wanted to, there's no tributing monsters, there's no fancy card effects. What you see is what you get. Whatever these numbers say on the card, that's how good it is. There's not much strategy beyond attempting to get your strongest, your highest numbered monsters onto the field. There are very few useful magic or traps. Maybe I'm being a little harsh because it does have the fusion mechanic, but that's not what I would call balanced 
or fair or transparent or even something that makes sense. In the actual card game, in order to fuse two monsters together, first you need to have both cards available in either your hand or on the field, and then you need to play a magic card called Polarimization. Here, you can just attempt to fuse anything with anything. Doesn't mean that it'll work, because it normally won't if you just do it willy-nilly. There's no in-game indication if a fusion will go through or not, so you just need to trial and error it, then memorize which cards in your deck fuse with each other. As a kid, I never came close to beating this. I think I made it as far as Pegasus, which if you've never played the game is about halfway, but that's when the difficulty really starts to pick up and it becomes nigh on impossible unless you spend hours upon hours grinding for better cards. After the first few duels, your deck quickly becomes outclassed in terms of raw power, so you're forced to rely on that fusion mechanic to overcome this disadvantage. The best card you're able to fuse in the game is called Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. It has 2,800 attack points, and the next best card you're able to craft is 2,300, so it's quite a bit higher. For most of the game, he can only be summoned by mixing two dragons and a thunder card in a three-way fusion. Later on, as your base cards become more powerful, you'll only need one dragon and one thunder monster, but the fact remains. Your ability to progress in this game, for most of it, is entirely dependent on how easily you're able to get this dude on the battlefield. But even if you're able to summon him at will, around the time you get to Pegasus, that's still not enough, because your opponents will start playing cards like the Blue Eyes White Dragon, the Bee Skull Dragon, the Meteor Bee Dragon, the Gate Guardian, the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon all of which dwarf that 2800. If your opponent plays one of those last two, you're pretty much fucked the entire game, unless you manage to draw either a Dark Hole or a Regeki, which wipe out all the monsters on the enemy's field. In order to stand a chance in the endgame, our beloved twin-headed Thunder Dragon simply doesn't cut it anymore. He's still a useful tool, he's still something that you need to have in your deck, but it's not enough alone. You're gonna need a few other things. The first thing you're gonna need is the best card this game naturally lets you have, which is the Meteor B Dragon at 3,500 attack. And getting it works like this. Every time you win a duel, your opponent will give you one card, as indicated by the bottom of this victory screen. You're graded on a scale of S to D, with S being the best, D being the worst, for how easily you're able to win. The higher your rank, the better chances for getting good cards. This guy right here is known as the Meadow Mage, and he has the highest drop percentage for the Meteor B Dragon. The highest one at a whopping 0.9%. And that's only if you're able to get an A or an S rank against him. If you get B or lower, then your chances fall all the way down to 0.0%, aka he will never drop it. And getting an A and S rank is pretty tough. I'm not sure of the exact conditions, but it means you can't lose more than a few hundred life points, and you can't take more than like, I don't know, five turns. So the Forbidden Memories metagame, if you're in it to finish it, is to play up until the Meadow Mage, battle him literally hundreds of times so you can get at least one Meteor Bee Dragon, but you're probably gonna want more than one. And even then, you're not done, because the last fights will play Gate Guardian like their life depends on it, so you need equip cards, you're gonna need Regeki, you're gonna need Dark Hull to go along with your MBD. But the grind for those cards is arguably even worse. The best character to grind magic cards off of is Isis. And I don't even know who this is, she's not in the show. Unlike with the Meadow Mage, it's not enough just to beat her. In order to get characters to drop magic cards in this game, you're pretty much forced to make them deck out, which means make them burn through all of their cards. Which is not a difficult task, but it's a time-consuming one. And even after all of that, there's only a small percent chance she'll actually give you the cards you need. At least with Meadow Mage, once your deck gets rolling, you can knock them out in a couple minutes, but you're looking at like 10 to 15 minutes to make people deck out. As mentioned earlier, this is one of the most infamous games in all of speedrunning, because the only thing that matters is how lucky you get with these card drops. If you get a Meteor B Dragon on your first couple attempts, then you're golden, but if those roughly 1 in 100 odds don't go in your favor right away, then I'm sorry, no record for you, you're forced to restart. Speedrunning is fucking brutal, man. I've beaten this game legitimately before, but for the sake of this video, I used a popular fan mod where every opponent drops 15 cards at once. And even with this advantage, you're still required to grind. 
At least a little bit. It's a shame this game is so unforgivingly difficult, because its presentation and story even are sublime. I love the artwork, too. It's an incredibly beautiful game and has a wonderful soundtrack. I've used the music from this game in many O video in the past and will continue to do so in the future. I have so much nostalgia for Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, but I'll be the first to admit it's a terrible video game. Not properly thought out, half-baked adaptation of a then-fictional card game. It has a special place in my and many other children of the 90s hearts, but if you're not a part of that incredibly specific demographic, there's little appeal. After Forbidden Memories, Konami was absolutely nowhere near done making Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. There was even a sequel to this game on the PlayStation 2 called The Duelist of the Roses, which I have admittedly never been able to get into. I imagine playing this now is what it would feel like playing Forbidden Memories today, removed from all nostalgia. It's just a confusing mess to me. I'm sorry if you grew up on this and it was your childhood Yu-Gi-Oh game, but it just doesn't vibe with me. You'll have to get your Duelist of the Roses kicks somewhere else. Yu-Gi-Oh games were most prevalent in the early to mid-2000s, where before I mentioned that they put out 12 on the Game Boy Advance, and you need to keep in mind the Game Boy Advance didn't live that long. This was in a five-year span they put out those 12 games just on that one platform. Every kid with a Game Boy Advance had at least one of these, right? And for me, I don't own it in box, and I couldn't find the cartridge to show you right now, but it was the Eternal Duelist Soul. That was my childhood Yu-Gi-Oh game. This is just a no-frills Yu-Gi-Oh! The Official Trading Card Game Simulator. It's where I learned the real rules to the game, and I've played it so much that I know exactly how to construct a deck, how to cheese the AI in very specific ways, to guarantee that I will win every single time. It's from 2002, 21 years ago now, so the card game has obviously evolved way beyond what's here. It probably wouldn't be a great introduction to modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, but as a time capsule back to when there were only around 800 cards, for reference nowadays there's over 12,000, it's still a fun time. Duelist Soul is still my go-to Yu-Gi-Oh! Game Boy Advance game, in fact, because it's blisteringly fast. The latter GBA games need to constantly check for all these disparate variables and conditions, and it greatly shows up in the pace of play. Duelist Soul may be the most primitive, but it's also the quickest as a result. Supremely easy title to quickly turn the game on, get a duel in, then shut it off. You can get in, get your Yu-Gi-Oh! fix, get out. The Game Boy Advance Yu-Gi-Oh! games can all be placed into one of three categories. You have titles such as The Eternal Duelist Soul, which can be classified as battle simulators. Their goal was to accurately recreate the physical card game in video form. Some of these were even used in tournaments in lieu of actual cards. And it's easy to see why. Instead of spending hundreds or even thousands building a deck, just buy the video game and get all the virtual cards you need from there. Eight of the 12 Game Boy Advance games can be classified as such. Two only came out in Japan, and one only in America and Europe, so the numbers get a little funny, but this highlights a phenomenon which would never happen today. Before easily applicable updates, you couldn't just patch the Yu-Gi-Oh! video game to include new cards. Every time a new batch came out, you'd also need to re-release yet another video game to keep up. Hence why we got multiple battle simulators a year. The highest regarded fan favorite of this category seems to be, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong because again, I'm not really a part of the Yu-Gi-Oh! community as it is, but GX Duel Academy appears to be the consensus pick of the litter. This is my first time playing it because, again, as mentioned earlier, GX was after my time, but for a battle simulator, there's a cornucopia of personality. Most of these just have a static menu where you select who you want to duel, but here you're given this whole island where you can go to different areas, talk to NPCs, talk to girls who don't want to duel me or have anything to do with me. The premise is you're at this school, and Duel Monsters isn't just a thing you do in your free time, nor is it an extracurricular activity, nor is it one of the subjects or areas of study you could possibly learn about. It's the only subject you learn about. The sole thing. The only thing this school teaches. You're at Yu-Gi-Oh! University. The logistics of that, trying to wrap my head around it, is making my brain explode. Most elementary and middle schools even in real life banned or at least heavily restricted when you were allowed to even play Yu-Gi-Oh! So in a stark contrast from reality, this was every kid's dream! More games! More games! Yeah! 
It's like that meme. I would go to school if this was the teacher, this was the uniform, this was the bus, and this was lunch. There's a daily schedule, you go to class, you take tests, you get a cell phone where you speak to your fellow classmates. This is if Persona was a Yu-Gi-Oh! battle simulator. And it's even more impressive because it actually predates Persona 3, in many ways the origin of the modern format of that series. I only played this one for a couple of hours, but I liked what I saw. Enough to keep playing? Eh, probably not if I'm being honest, but... Enough where I can certainly see why it's popular. Accounting for all eight battle simulators, this leaves four other Yu-Gi-Oh! Game Boy Advance games which are not centered around the trading card game. Two of which have absolutely nothing to do with cards of any kind. Dungeon Dice Monsters is based on that four episode arc in the show where Yu-Gi has to defeat Duke Devlin at a game of his own invention. It's one of the more memorable one-off storylines, and Duke would become a regular amongst the main cast, at least through Battle City. After that, I don't really know. I know the first two seasons like the back of my hand, but three and up, I have absolutely no idea what happens. They never aired those episodes on Cartoon Network, so I never saw them. Maybe they play Dungeon Dice Monsters again at some point, but... If not, that's a ballsy move to base an entire video game, the first one released on the Game Boy Advance, believe it or not, off of what amounts to a filler footnote from the show. I'm aware there was a physical release of Dungeon Dice Monsters because I had it as a kid for one, but I never could find anyone else to play it with me. And judging by the ridiculous prices physical Dungeon Dice Monster sets go for on eBay, I'm guessing it didn't catch on. I enjoy Dungeon Dice Monsters. It's an interesting game, which is unfortunately ruined by the AI's complete lack of understanding as to how to play itself. Seriously, this game's AI is a monkey at a typewriter. If given infinite chances, I'm sure it could write the next great American novel, aka win exactly one battle against me. But if you have an IQ of over 70, you'll Goomba stomp its brains out every single time. There's also Destiny Board Traveler, which is like a much worse Mario Party ripoff. And to the best of my knowledge, has nothing to do with anything they do in the show. I haven't played much of it, just a few minutes in fact, to capture the footage you're looking at right now. But it has a horrific reputation, with many calling this the worst Yu-Gi-Oh! video game of all time. So that's 10 out of 12 games accounted for, but what about the final two? Well, I have them right here. And this is where I come in as an RPG-centric YouTube personality. I present Yu-Gi-Oh! The Sacred Cards, and Yu-Gi-Oh! Rechef of Destruction, which places you into the world of Yu-Gi-Oh! where you can do everything you've always dreamed about doing. Hanging out with Yugi and Joey, going on dates with Taya, picking on Tristan, defeating Kaiba, defeating Merrick, saving the world getting the god cards. These are Yu-Gi-Oh! RPGs. You walk around Domino City in control of this orange-hatted, non-canon OC that you name yourself, in fact. Sacred Cards takes place during the Battle City arc, and most of the same events occur, only instead of Yugi being the central character and hero of the story, it's your OC. You end up doing mostly everything Yugi does in the show, essentially replacing him, but he's also still a character in this game, just kind of awkwardly hanging out in the background of what is supposed to be his story. All the major battles in Yu-Gi-Oh! Season 2, your character just kind of waltzes in and takes care of them. It's strange how worthless the main characters of the show are. The reason to exist in this rendition of the story is to job out to various baddies so you can step in and protect them. I win all three Egyptian god cards. I beat Kaiba, I beat Joey, I beat Merrick, I beat Strings, I beat the Rare Hunters which they renamed Ghouls because apparently that's what they're known as in Japan. We got the better name. Rare Hunters is way cooler than Ghouls. And I fucking beat Yugi. I'm the best. I'm the king of games. Despite releasing after The Eternal Duelist Soul, for some inscrutable reason, neither one of these games used the actual rule set from the physical card game. Absolutely no idea why. You would think that not only would it be easier to repurpose the work you already did there as this game's combat, but it would have been greatly preferred to going off and inventing your own new mechanics. Apparently it adopts the Game Boy Color game, Dark Duel Stories style of combat, but I've never played that. And again, I'll ask, why? Why do that? You're only allowed to have five cards in your hand at a time, very few monsters have effects, and the ones which do differ from their real-life counterparts. There are no phases, you know how in a normal duel there is a draw, a main, and then battle phases? 
Here you can just attack, then play another card, then attack again, then play a magic card, then set a trap, then attack again. It's madness. There's no structure at all. There's also a Pokemon-esque typing system. Forbidden Memories actually had something similar too. If your astrology sign had an advantage over on other cards, then you gained 500 attack and defense, which is a reasonable bonus. But in these fucking games, it doesn't matter what your stats are. If one card has a type advantage over another, it wins unconditionally. Your opponent's zero attack Unhappy Maiden card can theoretically one-shot a monster with infinite attack and defense. Thankfully, unlike in Pokemon where typing is this huge tangled web, here it's much simpler. Each card is only strong and weak against one other type. So this doesn't end up coming into play as often as you might expect. It's almost like how as kids we would play Yu-Gi-Oh! Because I know we never played correctly. It was always just imitating what we saw on TV. We'd all stack the top of our decks, too, with all the best cards. But everyone was doing it, so naturally nobody wanted to shuffle, so... It was really just us kids showing off our cards. But I haven't even gotten to the most out-there mechanic. You see these numbers on this screen? Duelist level? Deck capacity? If you've never played this game, you might be asking yourself, What the hell are those? There are these titles' strangest mechanic. Every card in the game has a specific cost associated with it. Let's look at my deck. Faith Bird has a cost of 183, Dark Holes is 40, Regeki's is 50. You're not allowed to use a card which is a higher cost than whatever your duelist level is. And the sum of your card's costs, that is every card in your deck's cost added up, is not allowed to exceed your deck capacity stat. Your deck must always contain exactly 40 cards, so it becomes this weird jigsaw puzzle with you trying to fit in as many good cards as you can without going over the limit, then finding low-cost alternatives or just other low-cost cards which are actually viable just to fill up deck space. I like this, it's a good mechanic, but it makes absolutely no sense in regards to the overall game world. Who determines what your duelist level is? And who is enforcing these rules? Before every fight, are we as characters supposed to check the other person's ID and deck to make sure they conform to the rules? This system is also a terrible way to structure a tournament because it gives players with higher duelist levels such a large advantage over the smaller players. It's a structure which props up the status quo and would render upset victories almost impossible. If this were to actually happen in the world of Yu-Gi-Oh, it's easy to imagine Kaiba would just give himself 100 times more duelist points than everyone else and there would be nothing anyone else could do about it. He would be unstoppable. But that's a nitpick. It's a good system in this game because it forces you to think about your deck in a way that you normally would not. It makes you use some of the more off-the-beaten-path cards and adopt strategies beyond just throwing out your best at all times. Sacred Cards is a pretty easy game. I beat the whole thing from beginning to end in 5 hours and 41 minutes. For a dumbed down, obviously cheaply made, I mean look at it, graphically it's awful, no cohesion whatsoever, just different art styles plastered all over the place, shitty pre-rendered backgrounds. For the piece of shit this is, it's a fine little distraction. I would have preferred that it had used the official rule set, but when judged as an adaptation of the show and not the card game, this is acceptable. Making this video was smooth sailing up until here, but if you're a Yu-Gi-Oh! Super fan, you know exactly where this video is going to go when I start talking about Reshef of Destruction. Because this is the most hardcore video game I have played since at least Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. The game itself takes place after the events of the Sacred Cards. You play as the same OC, you're still best friends with Yugi and Joey, only for some reason your cards fucking suck now. I know this is the Game Boy Advance and there was no real way to transfer your deck from one game to another, but this being a direct sequel to another game where you saved the world with your awesome deck of cards, it would have been nice to start you out with some at least okay cards. It would have been nice if they didn't start you out with all the same one and two star monsters you get at the beginning of all of these. It's like, what did I do with my cards? Did I rip them up? Did I sell them? Did I get out of Yu-Gi-Oh for like a year and now I'm getting back in? Instead of aping events from the show, 
everything that happens in Rashif of Destruction, to the best of my knowledge, is completely original. Nothing that happens in this game happened in the show. Which is good because in theory it means you're not going to be awkwardly stepping in to do everything Yugi and the main characters normally do in canon, but that's only in theory because it suffers from the exact same problems in that regard. Konami knew they made sacred cards too easy, so with this game it's obvious they tried to make it a little bit harder. So they swung in the opposite direction, and my god did they overcorrect. And not in a fair and challenging way either, more in a we're gonna fuck with the numbers until the game is not fun anymore kind of way. Allow me to explain. In Sacred Cards, when you win a regular duel against a no-name random, you would normally get five deck capacity points. And major boss battles would give you as many as 30. Of course, more deck capacity points means a better potential deck. In Rashif of Destruction, most duels, probably 75% of them, only give you one point. One measly point. And major boss fights that move the story along will grant you three. That's it. You're not getting any more than three at a time. That's fucking ridiculous. Now, if this were the only difference, it would still be manageable, but they rebalanced the card costs too. Remember how in Sacred Cards, my Dark Hole was 40 deck points? Well, in Rashif, it's 100. And Regeki went from 50 to 150. This might not sound that bad, but remember, you're only gaining one point at a time. Realize that a 60 point increase means 60 more duels to get those points. In Sacred Cards, if I wanted to add Dark Hole to my deck without making any sacrifices for other cards, to get those 40 points, it would mean defeating 8 random opponents. But in Reshift of Destruction, the same card requires 100, and at one point per battle, if you thought inflation was bad in the real world, the Yu-Gi-Oh economy is fucked, man. The gameplay is almost exactly the same, except for, wait, you see that? See how the cursor went apeshit for a second there? If you're playing this game, get used to that, because it happens every few seconds, and I'm not kidding. Every time any action occurs, and I mean any action, if you play a card, cursor does the thing. If you attack, the cursor does the thing. If you activate a trap card, cursor does the thing. It's there to check for card effects, and if something on the field actually has an effect, then this becomes even more annoying because the game feels the need to tell you what the effect is every time it runs the check. It re-shows you the same dialogue prompt telling you what the effect is. I had this penguin in my deck that increases the attack of all other aqua monsters on my side of the field, but it's almost not fucking worth using because you'll be reading the same text box a hundred goddamn times a match. Quickly after starting this game, I began to notice that sometimes I wouldn't be starting duels with the full 8,000 life points. That's been a universal truth in all these games, from Forbidden Memories all the way up through the most advanced battle simulators of today, 8,000 life points is the standard. In the show, they had 2,000 and then later 4,000, but at least for the video games, it was always 8,000. So in Reshef of Destruction, what gives? It took me a couple hours, but eventually I realized that your life points carry over in between duels. Like if you win one battle with only 500 life points remaining, you'll go into the next duel with only 500 points. Why? I get that it's more like a traditional RPG this way, but what a dirty, underhanded trick to just make your game a little bit more difficult. Your opponents sometimes start with more than 8,000 too. The final boss, for example, has 40,000 life points. Which got me thinking, maybe I can abuse the system here. Let's load up my deck with life point restoring cards, then challenge Tristan. Come here, you little bitch. And play the life point cards, pump them up, pump them up, win the duel. then bullshit, because you can't go above 8,000. No matter how high you get it in battle, you'll never start the next one with any more than 8,000, only less. The story is some dumb bullshit that's not even worth getting into. You go around collecting all the Millennium items while Yugi and Joey follow you around. Literally, they're right behind you the whole game, never doing anything. Eventually, you regain some Egyptian God cards, and the game's difficulty goes from utter bullshit to admittedly still very hard, but at least now you have an easy way to cheese the game. The God cards all have zero deck cost, so there's no reason not to use them. They each require 
require three tributes to summon, but once you do, the duel is essentially over because magic and trap cards don't affect them, and their attack power is so high that nothing any opponent throws at you can even begin to compare. Naturally, I built my deck around getting these guys onto the field as soon as possible, which means lots of cards that duplicate, cards which are able to summon other cards, Karibo paired with Multiply, loads of trap cards which stop the enemy's attack. I loaded my deck up with these types with the sole intention of just having three monsters on my side of the field at any given turn, doesn't matter how good they are, doesn't matter if they're these zero attack, zero defense tokens, you just need something to be able to summon these god cards. The major flaw in this is you still need to actually draw these god cards, so it's by no means foolproof, because you can go duels without ever seeing them, but it's a great way to get past any one opponent at any given time. The final bosses require you to beat the two hardest duels in the game, one after another on one life point count. Not only can my monsters not even begin to hold a candle to theirs, they're so powerful that they'll wipe you in two, three, or four turns. Meaning that for the last two fights, my win condition was to get one of the three god cards on the field in the first two or three turns. Because if I didn't, it was essentially game over. And you have to do them both in one run. There's no saving, there's no break in between. They also have 20,000 and 40,000 life points, as I mentioned earlier. This wombo combo at the very end of the game took me 36 tries. And on my winning attempt, I didn't even reduce his life points all the way down. I won by deck out. Because they kept playing monsters in defense mode, and there was nothing the Winged Dragon of Ra could really do about it. Yu-Gi-Oh! Reshef of Destruction took me 29 hours and 12 minutes to beat. It doesn't have any more content than Sacred Cards, which if you recall was a little under six hours, but that's just how absurd the grind is in this game. But that's okay, because I am the grind master. However, in Reshef of Destruction, it isn't fun. Its graphics, gameplay, and presentation are ripped straight out of the Sacred Cards, so you're not really getting much of anything new. The only reasons to play through this game are to A, make a YouTube video about it, or to B, brag to your friends while they stare at you cockeyed asking you why they should care about some smelly old Yu-Gi-Oh game from 20 years ago. So after the Game Boy Advance, Konami would continue to make Yu-Gi-Oh games, of course, but the releases have slowed down. They would put some on DS, they would put some on Wii, but with the advent of DLC in video games, they're became less of a reason to not just have one Yu-Gi-Oh game and then to patch in all the new cards as they come out. There was no reason really to release a yearly battle simulator as they had been doing in addition to the weird other side projects that they had going on such as like dungeon dice monsters for example and the one app approach is mostly what we see today with dual links and master duel but there was a, a notable interesting exception that i happen to have from a few years ago from 2019 on the switch in fact and if i open it up it actually came with three cards so Earlier when I said I don't even own any cards, I was lying, apparently. This is a more modern battle simulator, but the hook is you can play through the stories of not only the original Yu-Gi-Oh, but every other Yu-Gi-Oh show they made after the first one. I played all the way through the original story arc and had a pretty good time. It's presented in this visual novel style, not unlike Forbidden Memories, but you can tell this was done much cheaper and with less TLC than that was because there aren't many different reaction portraits, their lips don't move like they did in the PS1 game, and just generally speaking, there isn't the same attention paid to the little details. For example, in every Duelist Kingdom battle, there's this flowery meadow in the background, which already kind of doesn't fit, but it really doesn't fit when you're battling Pegasus in the Shadow Realm or Kaiba in front of that castle. Something as simple as a background image change would have went a long way here. There are also awkward story moments, such as in that duel with Kaiba. What happens in the show is Yu-Gi-Oh has him dead to rights. All he needed to do was attack and he wins. But then Kaiba threatens to kill himself. Literally, that's what happens if he loses the duel and Yugi wasn't willing to call his bluff. So Kaiba takes the win there. But in the game, you just play as Kaiba and win straight up. You're given a choice between using a story deck or your own custom deck before every duel. A neat idea, but calling these story decks is a little misleading. I don't think Yugi used Call of the Haunted against Joey in their first duel during school. And 
Banner of Courage, according to the Yu-Gi-Oh! wiki, didn't even exist until 2003, as in three years after this episode aired. They use the same deck archetypes, but the literal cards you use are not the same ones as they were in the show. In your first battle against Kaiba, you still use a deck built around Exodia, but they included all these newfangled cards that I've never heard of before. I tried using the story decks whenever possible, but late game they either became too complex for me to use properly, or they all just became ill-equipped to deal with what your opponents are throwing down. The last few fights against characters that I've never even seen can be brutal if you try and use the story decks. I gave myself three attempts with the default deck before allowing myself to use a custom one on each fight. And on the last few, I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to do shit with the cards they gave me. There's a certain joy in attempting to take what the game gives you and winning with that. It certainly forced me to interact with cards and effects I never would have considered using in a millennium years, but eventually the decks got too big-brained for me. The deck I constructed is probably horrific to use against real human opponents. Oh yeah, this game is online multiplayer, by the way. Not that I'm naive enough to think that I'm anywhere near ready to try that out. I focused on my most powerful four-star monsters, adding about a dozen of 18 and 1900 attack power cards. Mostly of the vanilla variety with no effects. I didn't care about their element, I didn't care about their species. Tribute monsters, rituals, cards with essay long effects, I stayed away from those. Too. Then we've got multiple Shard of Greeds, allowing me to draw an ass load of cards, throw in a Graceful Charity for the same reason, toss in some Black Penance, and a couple other one-size-fits-all equip cards. Then all of those staple overpowered Magic and Trap cards that you pretty much have to use, such as Mirror Force, Swords of Revealing Light, Change of Heart, and a favorite of mine from when I played Duel Links, Enemy Controller. I'm sure I just made real Yu-Gi-Oh players cringe, but it cuts through these AI opponents like butter, as I only lost one time with this deck. Despite this title being obviously cheaply made, this has got to be the best Yu-Gi-Oh game I've ever played. It has everything you'd want for everyone. Casual fans such as myself can plow through the story mode and enjoy it. It's got all these modern cards and mechanics for the hardcore Yugi heads, online play as well, so good stuff. Shout out to Zane Silver. Watching his series on Yu-Gi-Oh games is what inspired me to do this video. And shout out to Game Boy Land, which holy shit, he has incredibly in-depth content about a few of these specific games. His Reshef of Destruction breakdown is two and a half hours long, and it hammers home how stupidly difficult that game can be minute to minute, much deeper than I did here. And of course, as always, shout out to the patrons, shout out to the great William Robert Lee. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Good bye.